Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, I've got a few announcements of upcoming events here at Square Books. Um, tomorrow, um, we have a virtual event that you can attend if you like. I don't know how everybody feels about virtual events, but um, all you have to do is go to Square Books and, and register. But it is the, uh, the great Irish novelist uh, John Banville with this new um, novel, The Singularities. And it's at 4 p.m. Uh, Central Time, and he'll be in conversation with uh, Andrea, Andrea Kleeman, and uh, we do have signed book plates for uh, the Singularities, if you'd like to, to get that. Um, and then um, this Thursday uh, on Decker Mountain Radio, we have a uh, uh, native Mississippian, Catherine St. John, with her third novel, uh, Vicious Circle, and that'll be at 6 p.m. Uh, at the Powerhouse on Decker Mountain Radio. And then next Tuesday, um, November 1st, we have John Cofield. Many of you from Oxford may remember um, John Cofield's uh, family's photographs, and he had a book, Oxford, Mississippi, the Cofield Collection, uh, which came out a few years ago. And now he's got volume two uh, coming out, so that'll be at uh, 5 p.m. Um, uh, next Tuesday, November 1st. But tonight we're here for uh, Beth Boyd, one of our own. Uh, had a, got a Southern Studies Master's from uh, Ole Miss. And we're lucky to have uh, in conversation uh, Darren Grimm, also here at the university. And they're going to talk about uh, Beth's wonderful new book, Southern Beauty. So I'm going to turn it over to Darren. Please help me welcome Beth Boyd and Darren Grimm. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And thanks to the folks at uh, Square Books and all Square Books for hosting us tonight for this conversation about this wonderful new book, uh, fresh out from the University of Georgia Press, entitled uh, Southern Beauty. And to start us off, uh, Dr. Boyd is going to read us a selection from the book. And then we'll have a few questions and then yes. another reading and some more questions. And then we'd love to hear from y'all. Right. Thank you, Darren. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. So thank you to Square Books and to the Center for the Study of Southern Culture for the invitation. I'm uh, thrilled to be back in town. And I'm going to start uh, our evening together by uh, reading a passage from my chapter on sorority rush entitled Sister Act. The scene inside Fulton Chapel was almost enough to make one forget that it was two o'clock on a late summer afternoon in Mississippi. Despite the sweltering humid, uh, heat, the melting humidity, and the lack of air conditioning, the atmosphere inside was not one of languidness, but of high anxiety. Here, some 665 incoming female students were seated in groups of 70. They were chattering, they were excited, they were nervous. It was the opening scene of Sorority Rush, and at the University of Mississippi, known affectionately by most whites as Ole Miss, Rush was serious business. In the next few days, these young women, or girls, as they referred to themselves and one another, would submit to a process of evaluation that would determine the course of their social life for the next four years. For some, the stakes would be for life. But for the moment, they were all equal, at least equally nervous, as they checked out the competition. If the air was filled with tension, the scene revealed nothing but composure and preparation. Here, the rule was flawless skin, tasteful manicures, and healthy, glossy hair that had just been trimmed, highlighted, deep conditioned. Perfect vision and contact lenses prevailed. All hair was at least shoulder length. The clothing was studied casual. Shorts, sundresses, new sandals. A few false eyelashes. Full makeup, expertly done. <clears throat> the view was also one of almost panoramic whiteness. Fidgeting in tiered theater seats were banks of beauties, terraced profusion of blondes, redheads, and brunettes. Although the university had made considerable pro uh, racial progress since the crisis over James Meredith's integration of the campus in 1962, Sorority Rush, near the turn of the 21st century, remained largely segregated, a diversity holdout. 
in a state 37% African American, blacks at Mississippi's flagship university made up only 17% of the student body. The number who had attempted to pierce this particular sorority citadel of privilege was minuscule. The number who had been successful was even smaller. Rather, most still concentrated on gaining admission to the historically and predominantly African-American sororities on campus, which conducted their own series of intake events at a completely different time of year. The situation was replicated across the region with their modest houses, different criteria for membership, and separate calendar, the black sororities, highly influential in their own realm, made little impression on the campus social powerhouse, the white Greek system. Certainly, they were of little interest to those assembled in Fulton Chapel, who awaited a long anticipated moment, the chance to rush in Ole Miss's legendary system of social exclusion. From the ranks of eager and ambitious young women, configurations of power and privilege would be reinscribed. The gathered were expectant. On the brink of division, yet still one, they realized the portent of the moment. As the 20th century gave way to the 21st, Rush remained a daunting social obstacle course wherever it was enacted, but nowhere were the expectations higher the standards more stringent, or the consequences as crucial as in the South, where many a feminine future still depended on a few days in autumn. At Southeastern Conference schools, between 20 and 54 percent of female students routinely went Greek. But there was a qualitative difference, too. As schools in other parts of the country gradually uh, adopted more relaxed rush procedures featuring casual get-togethers, foreshortened rush schedules, and bidding practices geared toward inclusion rather than exclusivity, the large southern schools were slower to change, hanging on to old forms and arcane formalities that made a southern rush increasingly distinctive. Participants understood that time-honored social meanings about race and place, region and identity resulted from the process with established rush practices the best at producing and sustaining these meanings, demonstrating continuity, spotlighting difference, and measuring minutia of insider knowledge. Formal rush excelled at reinscribing long-standing social arrangements. The Southern investment in keeping rush formal, or frilly, signaled widespread commitment to existing structures of privilege. At the start of the 21st century, feminine performance remained the central production site of region, the sorority rush, the standout act. However, complications ensued. <laughs> The comforting insularity of the mainline Southern sorority house was disrupted by the dark rush sheet on the doorstep. Even at the dawn of the 21st century, the African-American hopeful threatened the premise and the promise of sorority membership as white Southerners had long understood them. Anticipation of a golden time of race and class privilege received in exchange for performing revered conditions of womanhood were shattered by the worthy black candidate waiting just outside. With natural race difference exposed as false, the pact of securing social position through gendered rituals of exclusion was suddenly absurd. The black rushy at the door was literally, historically, and imaginatively upsetting, a living, breathing invalidation of certain understandings of southernness. Sororities consequently reacted with defensive regret, falling back on age-old platitudes about freedom of association. For many years, this approach had worked. White Southern sororities remained segregated, segregated decades after the desegregation of Southern universities and indeed Southern fraternities. Adamant that desegregation not be forced on them, 
Sororities had maintained a passive approach to widening the pool of brush registrants, most never moving beyond the informational pamphlet universities bulk mailed to all new female students. Everyone has always been given the opportunity, officials sigh, echoing the same lame lament long offered to explain workplace hiring inequities of every sort. But where equal opportunity law spelled out the fact that it was not enough to crack, crack open the gates of access, active recruitment and mentoring were required to address entrenched patterns of discrimination. Sororities preserved the status quo and expressed few qualms about their racial makeup. Members were quick and vocal about espousing ideals of diversity, but slow and vague about their responsibility and action plans for realizing such goals. Compelled <clears throat> to contemplate radical change, actives dissembled, their imaginations seemingly immobilized, as if they could literally could not conceive of social equality in place of the privilege they had all but convinced themselves was the product of healthy competition and personal choice. Deflecting their gaze from the structures of unearned favor that benefited them, sorority members engaged in not seeing and not knowing in the blissful ignorance that was the bargain of privilege. Where less is spoken, more is performed. Faced with the unthinkable, sororities fell back on manners. The same precision, precision performance uh, exact, and exacting evaluation of etiquette that had produced these strongholds of advantage also protected them. African American students rushing traditionally white Southern sororities experienced the same polished welcome and rapt attention as everyone else, and so were baffled as well as disappointed when they were abruptly cut from every house in the second or third round. When Melody Twilley was denied a bid at the University of Alabama in 2000 and again in 2001, she was initially flabbergasted. Bright, attractive, upper middle class, and a native Alabamian, she was just like the other Rashids. Only her race set her apart. At Skit, I only went to one house, Twilley told reporters but I felt so at home at that house. This is elite ritual practice, explained anthropologist Susan Harding of Rush. It's tacky to be verbally racist, but perfectly acceptable to discriminate through your behavior, through your choices. Elite racism is implicit, acted out, behaved, not expressed in language. So I noted some words during uh, your reading, words like exclusion, um, set apart, insider knowledge. Um, that means, to my mind, that's hard to get information. It's, it's, it's behind a counter, behind a wall. Um, behind so, a paywall. Behind here. a paywall, perhaps. Um, so how'd you get that information? How'd you get into this project? How'd you conduct this research? How'd you get access? Yeah, so my research uh, uh, is sort of multi-pronged. Um, I did um, over 60 taped interviews. I also did ethnographic observational research of these uh, three rituals, uh, sorority rush being one. The other two that I focus on um, are beauty pageants and the uh, confederate pageant of the Natchez pilgrimage. And I also, um, went, as you will, uh, behind the scenes um, of these rituals um, so that I was getting different perspectives, both uh, from up close and from a distance. But how I got access, well, um, since we're talking about Sorority Rush, um, you don't just happen by the parties and think that you're going to slip in, right? <laughs> so I... Um, I started at the top, and I had permission, I believe Judy Trott gave me permission um, to, to uh, and they placed me with a, a rush group, and I went to all the parties. Um, and, the, but then I also wanted to hear from the girls, um, you know, why they were, what, why they were participating in this particular uh, ritual, what they got out of it, what they were concerned about what their experience was. And so I wanted to uh, 
interview them individually. And I can't remember what friend it was that said, well, you know what students understand? They understand sign-up sheets. So I, she said, you just make up a sign-up sheet and sign them up. So I did. I went to some chapter meetings and signed up some folks. So everyone was self-selected. Uh, you know, these are the folks who wanted to talk with me. And then uh, pretty much used a snowball effect. And I had m many more people than I could probably possibly talk with. Um, yeah, that's how it started. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I did this in each of the um, uh, pa uh, beauty pageant con uh, contestants are all about uh, publicity and they have no problems being interviewed about anything because th this is what they want is right. exposure. Um, at the Natchez pilgrimage was again a, a little different, but I also got um, permission from um, from club uh, garden club um, higher, you know higher ups and uh, had recommended to me people to interview. So I, I did all sort of three layers on, with all the individuals. Sounds like a lot of vouching. <laughs> vouching? Vouching, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it, didn't, it, it did help me that I'm a native Mississippian and I'm a white woman. I'm sure that that helped. Um, but so yeah, you, you can't just slip into um, you know, prep night. Uh, but it was a it was a a, a very informative informative experience. And so another another word that from your book, which is wonderful, and of course is for sale, so make sure that you pick it up, um, is resilience and the resilience of routines and rituals surrounding particularly southern white beauty. Yeah. Why such resilience in routines and rituals? surrounding specifically Southern white beauty? Well, so my book looks at these rituals as, um, and, and this Southern beauty figure who is sort of the legacy of the Southern lady and the Southern belle sort of um, glommed together in modern, uh, you know, in the modern South, um, and how she's been used as a uh, mechanism, a focal point for white nostalgia and for sort of remembering uh, collectively um, uh, the, the white southern past in a way that's comforting and appealing and something that you can um, put your own personal story uh, into that narrative. And so the resilience is important because if the southern beauty is this um, focal point for remembering in common this uh, nostalgic, mythic white South, uh, you have to keep the uh, ritual going. You know, it's, it's important that it's cyclical um, and that it's, that it's, that it is routine. So, um, you know, in a way it's, it really is the modern uh, legacy of, of the memory program that the United Daughters of the Confederacy sort of were so successful with, with their monuments and their bricks and mortar. And, and those um, often featured a uh, you know, young white, virginal in, uh, young woman sort of held aloft at these different um, Confederate monument unveilings and um, Confederate veteran uh, reunions. Um, so so the, this endangered white womanhood on the pedestal was, was always um, you know, she was she was the rationale and the motif for um, the white South, and and so when when those people, you know, when, when that movement inevitably died off at the last Confederate veterans, this impulse had to go somewhere, and I see it, uh, you know, continuing in these productions of, of white femininity. And, and, yeah. Do you see uh, different people, depending on different productions, engaging in these acts of resilience? You know, so different folks you know, working. Who's doing them? Who's doing them? <laughs> at Sorority Rush, it's different than, say, in Nat, obviously, in Nat has been in terms of different place, but difference oh. in terms of beauty pageants. Are there, is there an well, so, well, so there is some overlap uh, uh, with uh, beauty pageants probably being the most uh, democratic, and that's probably maybe not the best word, but, you know, anybody can um, enter. Uh, although that's also a little bit deceptive because often the local pageants were sponsored by uh, 
uh, civic organizations, or the JCs, or the people like that. And often there were, uh, you had to you know, sell advertisements to be a, a contestant. Uh, or you already had to be sort of, uh, your, your parents, your family needed to be part of a, um, part of the local business structure. So it was not quite as, uh, you could, you could, you could uh, compete, but you maybe didn't have a completely level playing field, right? right? Um, sorority Rush, um, a lot of people that participate have been expecting to do this practically their entire life because there's this familial um, socialization and there's a fair amount of uh, sort of familial pressure to, to do this. And it's this you know, anticipation, as I mentioned, of this sort of golden time of, of, um, of privilege that you're going to experience. Um, the Natchez, um, the uh, Natchez pilgrimage uh, um, uh, pageant, of course, is you have to be uh, a member of the families who are uh, in those garden clubs. Uh, but other, um, there are many, many pilgrimages, as you know, uh, and some are um, more far flung across the state. And uh, for, for some uh, strata of young women, uh, this was a common thing to be a part of um, if your mom or your your mom and her friends were part of uh, these uh, pilgrimage tour homes. Um, you would be called upon to to help receive or help out at these houses. I remember, I'll never forget uh, talking to my friend. I did all these interviews, right? Um, <clears throat> and being up at the Holiday Inn at the bar with the um, you know, the pretzels and the bad beer, the, the Miller draft or whatever, <clears throat> and, and talking to Ruthie Irvin about doing this. I think she lived down near uh, uh, Fort Gibson or Crystal Springs. And well, she said, well, yeah, back then, everybody had a hoop skirt in the back of their closet. And I said, Ruthie, how does a teenage girl fit a hoop skirt in your closet? And she said, you just, you just squeeze them just like a diaphragm. <laughs> You know? and so, but to her, it was very much a part and parcel of, you know, in the, I guess it must have been but maybe the 60s, early 70s, that it was a common thing for your, uh, for you to go and do this and help out at these, these two hours. So, yeah, it's, it's, in a way, it's really a, a class thing. This is the Holiday Inn where the graduate is right now. Yeah, now it's very upscale. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, would you read? Some more, particularly about silence and the sure. role of silence. Yeah, I have a little marks here. <clears throat> this is actually at the beginning of my book, uh, the introduction called Power Play. The decision was widely denounced as over the top. After University of Oklahoma members of Sigma Alpha Epsilon, SAE, a fraternity with Southern roots, were caught on video in 2015 chanting a racist song with references to lynching. Greek leaders and campus officials at the University of Georgia announced a prohibition of hoop skirts. The reaction among many white UGA students and onlookers ranged from irritation to disbelief. The costume of choice for such campus events as Kappa Alpha's Old South Week and SAE's Magnolia Ball had nothing to do with racial intolerance, critics claim. It was just fashion. And the crinoline embargo was yet another kowtow to political correctness. Contemplating attendance at such events without their sar sartorial standby, collegians wondered aloud, what did the hoot have to do with the hate? But at least one UGA administrator understood all too well the ability of Southern symbols to suggest and even celebrate structures of inequality. Relegating the hoop skirt to deep mothballs required only a single meeting with Greek student leaders who, concerned with inviting negative attention, came to agree that such attire was, quote, not appropriate in the context of some events. If there was dissension among their ranks, their silence concealed it. Ironically, the same campus leaders who brokered the ban limited its impact by quelling discussion of their decision. 
After a flash of national publicity, the story failed to gain traction, and other schools did not rush to enact similar prescriptions. Choosing silence over discussion, campus leaders shut down a potent symbol at UGA, but made no call for its curtailment elsewhere. In the end, the episode was a testament to the continuing power of Southern symbols, but also to the power of silence. So what are the roles of silence in your book? Well, uh, it, silence seems to recur. Um, I found it recurring uh, throughout my research. And I think it goes back to the role of silence uh, during the Jim Crow South, really. I, mean, I feel like uh, so much of, of how segregation was learned and enacted uh, was you know, sort of absorbed by young white children and their families. There were many parts, of course, of segregation that were uh, in law, in writing, uh, et cetera. But there are other things that were uh, simply learned and taught in a way that was not necessarily spoken. And in fact, one uh, sort of central tenet was things that were just not discussed, right? Because if you discussed them and thought about them too hard, it was this not seeing and not knowing that you needed to do. Keep, keep the, you know, go along, get along. Um, because so much of uh, segregation had to do with um, things that just didn't hold up to scrutiny. You know, the idea of natural race difference and of this endangered white womanhood who was in danger of, you know, needed to be protected from black men. You know, well, not really, neither one. And, but if you spoke out about it, or, uh, you know, this, these were things that were just not discussed. It was better, you know, don't think about it too hard uh, that this, this system of privilege that you're benefiting from uh, doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. But then also, uh, there's the Southern beauty is silent in a lot of ways in these productions. Um, I talk about, uh, in, in the mid-century, um, mid-20th century, um, these campus productions uh, uh, here, but at, at many, many Southern universities, feature this plethora, you know, of uh, beauty, beauty queen pageants. There was practically one every week. And this, again, she was held up as this symbol of region of, of the white South that was uh, you know, endangered, and, and of course, eventually, uh, segregation was endangered. The more it became endangered, the, the higher they held her up as this example of, you know, what the white South was, uh, what was worth fighting for. Uh, and so I talk about her as uh, these, these various uh, queens, of which there were so many, um, as the, the passive resistance that was this sort of silent twin of really loud, raucous, um, massive resistance. It was much more masculine in nature in the way it was portrayed. Um, but there was always this counterpart who was this serene, silent, um, you know, this, she was the motif and the rationale for the White South. Um, and she did a heck of a lot of cultural work that I think she had to cut kind of enough credit for <laughs> in terms of how we remember um, the Southern past. The argument this cultural work is ongoing. Yes, I do. And so therefore, what exactly are Southern white women gaining today and perhaps losing today by participating in keeping these kinds of rituals of silence, as you put it, or these embodied rituals going? Yeah, well, so they uh, secure their, their status, their racial status, their class status through this gender performance. Um, that, that's, that's what it, you know, in a nutshell. Uh, what was the second part of your question? Um, what are they winning and what are they losing? What are they winning? Well, what are they losing? Uh, I, have to, I have to point out that they, uh, you know, it's, it's at the expense of 
gender subordination in, in a lot of ways. And, and in the case of uh, sororities, you know, they, in my opinion, give far too much power to the fraternities in the way that they um, sort of, you know, they're so concerned about being able to swap and have parties with, you know, the highest status fraternities. And um, they're really, that's, that seems to be a loss. That doesn't seem um, terribly empowering. <laughs> yeah. What about the impact for the rest of us? For the rest of us? Um, well, you know, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, for instance, uh, public memory scholars have started talking about enlarging the we. When we say we, who do we mean? And we have still, you know, these, these performances and these rituals really further a sort of segregated public memory of the Southern Pass uh, that's, that's not helping us move forward and seeing ourselves in each other. Essentially, uh, relinquishing privilege is hard, right? I mean, that's that's what would have to happen to mm -hmm. for a change to occur. Mm -hmm. Would be for people to, uh, yeah, give up some of their or share some of their privilege. But these these rituals don't <clears throat> don't lend themselves to that. Right. Yeah, as you know, resilience, yeah. silence, exclusion. These are these are powerful. Yeah. yeah. So I think I'd like to open the floor um, to everyone else here. Glad to see all y'all here. Um, for your questions, uh, for Dr. Boyd, uh, just raise your hand and we welcome your your questions. Beth, your, your project has a long history. It began as a master's thesis in Southern Studies here, and yes. you did a version of it as a dissertation. So how, tell us a little bit about how your, pro your project developed. What's the history of this, of this project with the different kind of research? You mentioned that you discovered layers of this as you went, or how did you bring it to I, fruition? I, I did, well, slowly. <laughs> uh, I did discover layers um, as I went through, and I and things changed, and I was constantly rewriting from that time because uh, uh, complications ensued, as I, as I mentioned. Um, sororities did uh, nominally desegregate on some campuses, and, and so I was called to think, well, does this argument still hold water? Is it still viable? And I think you'll see when you read that chapter um, where the continuity is stronger than the change, or at least transformational change has not occurred. Um, and the other thing that happened while I was, and a similar thing with the Natchez uh, pageant, which went from being the, you know, it was the Confederate pageant from 1932 until in 2014, so it was pretty long. Uh, then it changed its name uh, a couple of times uh, but changed the production less so. It's actually more similar than it is different. Um, and the beauty pageants as well have had some changes, but I don't find them uh, changing the central logic of the production. So, so those were at different junctures I had to reconsider. And, um, and the other thing that happened was during the, this last certainly 15 years, um, this, the field of memory studies has exploded, and I was able to really ground it uh, in that literature and, and scholarship. Yeah, you were talking earlier about like these institutions trying to democratize or saying like, well, there's an equal quality of opportunity, like technically anyone can enter, but obviously that hasn't worked. So do you think that reform is possible to make them, like particularly the beauty patterns and stories, equitable and inclusive and like no longer a force for social exclusion, or is it so ingrained in the institutions that it's just beyond? Well, there are, 
some things that could be some actual action items that could take place, <laughs> you know, and, and, some, and in some um, organizations this is happening, um, where, you know, you could do away with blackballing and make it a more, the places that were first to be segregated were ones that, you know, if 51% of the, the membership voted to extend the bid, then they got a bid, and we're, so that doesn't happen if you have blackballing where one person can mix the invitation of a, of a, of a person. Now the other thing that, and you, the same thing with requiring recommendations yeah. and this whole legacy status thing, it's all kind of um, the, the system stacked against you. As I re read about this, this Alabama, you know, um, potential new member, as they're called now, um, you know, she was just like these other girls, her profile, and it really was simply her race that set her apart. Uh, but you can also, um, lessen the input of alumni. Yeah, because for many, many uh, organizations, the alumni play a big role, and they're part of the voting process, they're part of, part of drawing up the bid lists, and in, in the case of, I know um, in my research at the University of Alabama, um, they finally desegregated when one of the actives at a voting session during rush raised her hand and said, aren't we even going to discuss the black girl? And her name had been removed by these adult alumni. So that, and that's a kind of a silencing, actually, that um, has been extremely detrimental to you know, diversifying those clubs. So um, yeah, I mean, at the University of Alabama, when that happened, Judy Bonner, who was an administration official, she only took action after she was publicly shamed. And it was the students who did it. So this, this, in some ways it's a generational issue, not completely, not by a long shot, but I think that that would, would help. just going to wander into that because you have to already be in the right family. And in a way, that is uh, the least dependent on looks, but it, the entire production down there, from the tour homes to the um, historic Natchez pageant, or tableau, I believe they're calling it now, um, it's predicated on this, these antiquated gender roles where they perform, literally, you know, in the mix skirts and the um, of the lady in the bell. So in, in that way, they're most centrally performing that. But um, yeah, in, in, in the book, I talk about how performative it is and how even the participants um, differentiate between, you know, saying this is, in both beauty pageants and sorority rooms, well, this is not the real me. I don't usually look like this. I don't usually dress this way. But there seems to be a real um, yardstick still in place that young women feel the need to be able to uh, sort of hit the mark and perform this white Southern womanhood on demand. And that that's the, you know, that's what's being measured. And in fact, <clears throat> you know, I got a, Little known fact, I got a, a TikTok account in August just so I could eavesdrop on Bama Rush. And the it, anybody check that out? Yeah, totally. Well, the it girl of Bama Rush this year was a pageant girl from Ohio. And, uh, what's her name, Kylan. 
Um, and she was, and, and I was also uh, watching these uh, commentary, you know, TikToks talking back to Kyla and her, uh, her outfits of the day, and et cetera. And uh, one of the communications professors uh, said, you know, she's performing Southerness. <laughs> and so many of them are. In fact, the uh, University of Alabama, along with, some, I don't know about the um, University of Mississippi, but has really increased their scholarships given to out-of-state students um, and has increased their um, percentage of out-of-state students so that they can get out-of-state tuition. And, but there are many, many people who are from, uh, they're not, so it's not, it's only about 40% of uh, students there are from Alabama, but there, there seems to be a lot of performing Southerness, both men and women. And so, what, what does that say to me? I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think this is partially why Bama Rush became so like, appealing to everyone. And it's something that, you know, people who are watching it were kind of like, I'm not from here, um, but I'm fascinated by this. Yeah. Um, right? And so I think that's what people were seeing in Bama Rush, and it's like, what that that is something that you can pick up and put on as a costume so easily, supposedly. Um, right? It is Southern, well, you know, southern I got into right. this book because I was so fascinated by, um, you know, I arrived here working on my master's degree at a time when people were talking about Southern identity and what, what did it consist of and where did it come from. And then I came back after doing my doctoral coursework and I was living here for the second time. Uh, and I was so, um, as you say, fat, it's like impossible not to watch. It's you know, like watching a car wreck or something. And uh, with, the, with the competitive femininity that was just pervasive in all sorts of realm of life. And, I, and so I was sort of trying to put those two questions together. I mean, I kept thinking, well, if, if, if southernness is coded as whiteness for a lot of people, again, not sharing the we, not sharing the past, um, what does femininity, femininity have to do with it? And that's basically the question that, um, that started my, this book. Yeah. Yes. Um, what would your advice be to young women who are feeling pressured to enter into these stories but may want to like end generational cycles or just don't really want to be a part of the sorority because they know about <coughs> Uh, be strong. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of really thrilled with these, in answer to your question, with some young women that I talk about in the epilogue who have uh, spoken back uh, to, to older generations who, you know, part of how this gets perpetuated is that it depends on uh, coming of age rituals and an ever uh, incre you know, renewing supply of young women that it's you know, now it's my daughter's turn to be a queen of the Natchez Pilgrimage. So are you going to cut it off that year, or you know, can you do it? Wait one more year, and then it's somebody else's turn. And the same thing with sorority rushes. Now it's my daughter's turn to be a tridental, or, or whatever. Um, um, but there are some young women who have um, started, a, for instance, Change.org petition to get rid of the, the Birmingham Bells, <clears throat> and I think that's kind of thrilling. And um, the Cape Fear Garden Club um, on their own accord, sort of realizing what was coming down the pike and seeing other, uh, have disbanded the Azalea Bells. And so that's sort of exciting. And then um, the Chattanooga Cotton Ball, a young woman who was part of one of the families that she should have been, you know, a ready royalty, um, wrote a letter to the club and said, you know, this it, 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 in our community that is trying to heal, this is racist, classist, and sexist, and you know, thank you for the invitation, but no thanks. <laughs> so, um, and, and um, at a certain point to really make change, you have to, you, you, you can't, uh, you know, you have to opt out of the club, right? And, and uh, I talk about that in the ch uh, Natchez chapter um, about people who, you know, Mom and said, I wish it could be different. Um, but then they don't actually 
withdraw their membership because they want their kids to go to the pool that's owned by the club. And so <clears throat> it's, a, it's a personal choice, but I think that, uh, you know, I'm hoping that young women your age will read and discuss. Yeah? In your book, do you discuss sexual orientation in the sororities? A little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, and specifically, um, uh, gender performance. Um, well, there's a couple of skits. I, I don't look at it extensively, but um, where the uh, some of the women play a masculine role in the skits, and this is a routine um, thing that goes on. It's part of. You'll just have to read it. <laughs> but also, I mean, you bring up a good point because uh, this year at this year's Bama Rush, uh, one of the hot potential new members was um, a non-binary uh, person, and let me think of his name. Somebody else can tell me his name. I can't remember. Grant. What? Grant. Grant, yes, Grant. And he became a huge favorite. Because, you know, it's all because of social media that we know about this uh, at all. But he was going through, and you know, he complicates this whole idea of, and he was performing femininity pretty well, I thought. He was super cute. Or they were, I should say. Um, and, and he had a, a, a big following. It was like, you know, people going on making TikToks about justice for Grant. And <laughs> I mean, it really does beg the question of, of what's going on. And of course, there, there have always been um, um, not everyone in sororities is, there are, you know, plenty of lesbians in sororities. But so much of sorority life is heteronormative, the activities and the emphasis and the way the um, activities are structured, um, that it doesn't leave a lot of comfortable space for uh, non-straight people. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Any other questions? May I ask yeah. one? Okay. Okay. Well, I was going Okay. Yeah, I found your discussion about um, the development of sorority row on the University of Mississippi campus pretty interesting, which I think extends to Southern beauty being architectural as well. And when you kind of look at the landscape, it's, it's almost as if they've always been there and looked that way, but you talk about the how development and, and how that responds to a particular historical moment. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, because that was part of that uh, um, mid-century, that part of that Jim Crow response, and um, to, to, to drop back, and I don't spend much time, I think this is a fascinating, I wish somebody would, maybe someone already has written a book about this, but uh, if you look back at the old uh, Ole Miss yearbooks, and you look at the pictures of the early sorority houses, they were a variety of small suburban architectural styles, the little split levels, and this, that, and the other. And they were nothing like these faux plantation mansions that's the typical style now. And so uh, what I talk about briefly is how uh, during, uh, you know, the, especially the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, uh, when there was a lot of a resistance to desegregation and social equality, racial equality, uh, that the sorority houses get built onto with these home improvements consisting of you know, adding lots of columns and rocking chairs and plantation shutters, and it's very aggressive to where you get this, what we have now, I just out of curiosity walked down the street today uh, to see what, in, in, you know, even more have been, they keep getting bigger and bigger. I'm not sure how much bigger they can get. Um, but it's still the, the predominant architectural style. <clears throat> but that also happens with, with uh, just um, residential building as well during that time period. You know, it's the, everybody puts up a colonial, there's lots of columns, and um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting response. Some, some um, LSU built all of theirs at the same time, and they have a certain style. Um, University of South Carolina is much more recent, but they are a similar style, but they were all built at the same time. So um, someone should go back and, and 
read the history of those building projects. <laughs> I would love that. Thank you. All the way back. Um, at the end of the chapter on sororities, you briefly touch on the machine at Alabama's. Can you expand on that and its effect on sororities? Uh, the machine, the political machine at the University of Alabama that, um, how would you describe it, that ensures block voting, in essence, by um, sorority, uh, sororities and fraternities to control student government. Um, I don't quite, what, what are you asking? How did it become so powerful in Alabama and why is it not um, how, how does this link into the, the, the Well, I'll tell you one way it links in is that the sororities, um, again, relinquish their political agency by agreeing to block vote for whomever the machine selects. Pure and simple. Yeah. Scary. Yes. Hey Beth, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm interested in um, when you use in-depth interviews, when you talk to people, um, the, the kind of experience that you had there. Do you, do you, when we think about feminine beauty, uh, especially as you described it here, you know, it, it's often that we think of the, you know, the individual being the cultural dupe, right? That they are just succumbing to the, um, you know, these ideologies and the powers and so forth. And you're, you're painting a, a, a strong picture of, of what's going on, structurally speaking and institutionally speaking. But can you talk about uh, any of these interviews where people were reflecting, you know, on their own agency um, within this large, these larger institutions, and you know, any attempts, uh, you know, that that people might have talked to you about of, of changing from within? You know, I, I feel a little lack of hope here for uh, that happening. But I do. But I. But I guess I just think that human agency. You know, we must. Have a little hope well, about human agency, so I'm wondering whether yes, you have any I, I have hope. Yeah. Yes, uh, I have hope, although certainly my book points more towards continuity than change. Right, right. Um, but, and some of my informants were more reflective than others, yeah. of course. Uh, some of them, uh, quite a bit so, um, yeah. and, and were sort of torn about their part in these uh, structures. But, Typically, uh, and, and I suppose there are some, even like uh, Kylan at the University of Alabama, she's like, you know, um, she's out to get what she can get, and she's up front about it. Uh, whereas many of these others are, are um, you know, they know that part of the way to get what they want and get in the house that they want is to perform this sort of deferential, it's kind of ironic, this deferential um, feminine persona. Uh, from the clothing to the manner to the, you know, I talk about that, uh, uh, what, it, what it takes to be, um, to be at the top of the bid list. Um, but I, I did not find uh, enough people who uh, felt strong enough that they would actually break the chain of, of con continuity from, you know, for, for, often for familial reasons, you know, Oh, not so much, uh, I'm thinking about the, the Natchez scene. Um, refu there were people who did refuse to be queen. It used to be a foregone conclusion that if you were invited to be queen, you know, your, your hat was made and nobody would ever say no. But now there's, uh, people have other priorities and goals. It's, uh, it's nice, it's fun, their parents would love them to do it. And maybe they'll do it, but it's not a foregone conclusion. So, so, but that doesn't mean they're not in the art club. So I'm not quite sure how to. Yeah. Yeah. No thanks. And of course, uh, the people who truly um, de pledged or um, dropped out of the brush uh, were not the ones I interviewed. Right. So there's a certain self-selecting group there. 
maybe the next book? That would be a good one. Maybe someone else can write that one. <laughs> 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 the ones, the ones who uh, deep lives and started a different organization. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. okay. I believe we have time for one more question. Anyone has a final question? If not, then I'll ask it. Yeah, okay. Um, where do you see this going? Where do I see this going? Um, this question? <laughs> or, uh, you mean the... The, the entire the cultures that you described, Southern beauty, what state might be the next iteration? I, I asked that given that, talk about the performative aspects of it, you know, we are all on camera now. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we can put ourselves on camera, and that has both an element of performance, it also has an element of that's how you can be better policed. You know, so it seems like some of those dynamics are, are, are very much connected to our social media and TikTok yes, age. Yes. So where do you see this going next? Well, I see both hope and sort of some more of the same. I, I talk at the very end of my book about the uh, sociological study that was done recently at the University of Georgia of these game day selfies that many of these uh, young college students feel compelled to mark the, document the occasion. And they look sort of more demure than usual. It's a very, it's this white womanhood they're documenting and then they're sending it out into the you know, into virtual spaces um, in perpetuity, and it's it's very um, it's prescriptive, right? But then I also think um, that with the conversations that um, that Americans as, at large have been holding uh, since the um, murders in Charleston, uh, you know, the riots in Charlottesville. Um, and you know the murder of George Floyd that people are finally you know why did it take that why did it take these murders to really look inside and look in the mirror and sort of admit that a lot of what they're basing their view of the past on and their, and their relationship to it regarding this, uh, the white south's past um, you know, that's when we finally started seeing demands um, from all sorts of people to get rid of this commemorative culture and, and do something different. I'm sort of excited about the young women I mentioned, uh, you know, taking apart these bell organizations that are refusing to take part. Um, but I also I'm excited about uh, organizations like Monument Lab that are reimagining um, commemorative spaces and actions and performances to so that we can, instead of on our landscape, be one of um, Confederate nostalgia, uh, have performative uh, remembrance that does other things. Yeah. So I think that's I think that's hopeful, Kirsten. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Silences and conversations. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Beth Boyd, for joining us today. <laughs> Uh, should be signing books. There are books obviously available for purchase, and we certainly invite you to do that. Thank yes. you.